Newton Brooks by Thomas Mann. Uh, this is one of the scripted video review series, which I take kind of an old report from university or an old book review and uh, try and make a YouTube video out of it. Um, so, right, this, the title is actually a little bit misleading. The report I did was on Booten Brooks through kind of the lens of the subject, subjection of women by John Stuart Mill. Sorry, I keep wanting to say subjugation of women, but the essay is actually subjection of women. Um, now that's not a book, that's an essay, so I'm not gonna call that a book report, the, but Booten Brooks is a book. Um, so Booten Brooks was assigned reading in one of uh, modern European history classes I took. It's not, it's not a history book. It's a novel. It was published in 1902, but it's um, looking kind of backwards on uh, the German history in the 19th century um, through kind of like a fictional family, although this fictional family was based on a real life family, like it was based on Thomas Mann's own family. And, you know, he changed the names of some of the people, but I think he still got a little bit of trouble for how certain characters were portrayed. Um, the his, it's historical fiction in the sense that there are some historical issues in the background, like the unification of Germany and stuff like that. But mainly it's just kind of the story of this family which gets followed through three generations. And it kind of starts off as a very prosperous family. And then you can see by the kind of the end of the book, uh, the fortunes of this family have kind of completely changed. But it's also just an interesting study in how, kind of how the family changes through the generations. And it's originally written in German, so I'm sure some of this will depend on the particular translation you get. But the translation that we had was really well written. I don't know who the translator is. I don't, I don't even really know how many translations there are out there. Maybe there's only kind of one popular English translation. But I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I felt like it was easy to read, fun to read, interesting kind of seeing these characters and the changes they go through over time. Um, kind of more recently, I've been reading the Cairo Trilogy uh, by Naguib Mahfouz, which is an Egyptian author. Um, but I thought that was, it reminded me a lot of the Brooks, kind of following this family over the course of uh, a long period and seeing how they changed. Anyways, um, the essay I did was not really a book review of the Brooks. It was analyzing certain aspects of the Brooks story through the, subject, through the lens of the subjection of women by John Stuart Mill, which, when was that published? I think John Stuart Mill's essay was um, published in the 1850s or something like that. Uh, so that was also kind of a historical document and kind of reading for the course. In doing so, I kind of focused on a rather narrow aspect of a very expansive novel. So this is kind of going to give it a little bit of a distorted view of um, the scope of the novel, but the, the original novel is well worth kind of seeking out if you're interested. Anyways, on to the original report, which is not actually about the Brooks, but about the Brooks and John Stuart Mill's essay, The Subjection of Women. Quoting from Mills, he says, The subjection of women to men being a universal custom, any departure from it quite naturally appears unnatural. In this quotation, John Stuart Mill quite accurately explains why the rest of the characters see as perfectly normal the situation Antony Budenbrook finds herself in. Throughout her life, the cultural norms and laws that regulate her position as a woman trouble Antony. Antony is a Millsian example of the subjection of women, as can be shown by looking at her childhood, her marriage to Grunlick and to Permeander, and the marriage of her daughter, Erica. As a Bootenbrook, Tony, which was the nickname used in the book for Antony, led a privileged childhood. Tony's attitude towards her neighbors was one of condescension to anyone who was not of the same social class. Mann summarizes her attitude as, just try and get me in trouble. If you don't happen to know, I am Counsel Bootenbrook's daughter. Quotation from the novel there. 
Tony's concern about whom she associates with as a woman of an upper middle class family is visible already in her childhood. However, she is at this point free from the obligations that will plague her adult life. Later, it becomes evident that this carefree, privileged childhood was the happiest time in her life, when she, when she did not want to sell the house that she grew up in to counsel Hagenstorm. Sorry, it's a little bit confusing. It means the part in the novel when she didn't want to sell the house indicates that childhood had been the happiest point in her life. She had too many happy childhood memories in that house. As Tony grew to adolescence, Mann writes, all in all, Tony's adolescence was a happy time. The harsh realities of what it means to be a woman were to come crashing down on Tony later into her teens. She was pressured into a marriage with Grunlich that she did not want. Tony's father wanted the marriage, and as Mill points out, it was practically impossible for the girl to refuse compliance if the, pa if the father persevered. Now, although he did not actually force her to marry Grunlich, Tony's father put tremendous pressure on her to comply. Both of Tony's marriages showed her inferior position in society as a woman. Grunlich, although he did not treat her cruelly, had completely control of her life, had complete control of her life. He did not even allow her to leave the house without him. Yeah, that sounds like he's treating her cruelly, actually. I should take that back. Mill addresses this in his essay. She, meaning a wife, can do no act whatever but by his, meaning her husband's, permission. Grunlich's reason for doing this was to present, prevent Tony from finding the truth out about him, that he only married her for her money. Mills calls this kind of action the scandalous abuse of the marriage institution, which is perpetrated when a man entraps a girl into marrying him without a settlement for the sole purpose of getting possession of her money. Both parents neglected Erica, the child of Tony and Grunlich. Grunlich criticized Tony for not being affectionate towards Erica and Tony fiercely defended herself. However, it was clear that Tony left Erica with the servants at any opportunity. This goes along with the theory of Mill on another matter. The general opinion of men is supposed to be that the natural vocation of women is to be of a wife and a mother. I say supposed to be because, judging from Acts, from the whole of the present constitution of society, one might infer that their opinion was directly contrary. They might be supposed to think that the alleged natural vocation of women was of all things the most repugnant to their nature. Although Tony had many servants under her, this did not improve her condition. Again, quoting from Mill, He's, Mill says, a sultan's favorite slave has slaves under her, over whom she tyrannizes. But the desirable thing would be that she should neither have slaves nor be a slave. Tony was still miserable despite the fact that she was in authority. However, Counsel Butenbrook, once he realized what a terrible marriage he had put his daughter into, was able to pull her out. It was easier to get a divorce in Germany at that time than it would have been in England, which Mill, Mill was writing about England. Uh, and in England, only the parliament could grant a divorce. In addition, because Grunlich could not provide for his family, Tony had possession of their daughter Erica, although Mill emphasizes that usually the case is the opposite. However, Tony's dowry was lost. Uh, Mill has a quote for this as well. Mill says, The two are called one person in law for the purpose of inferring that whatever is hers is his. But the parallel inference is never drawn that whatever is his is hers. 
Tony's marriage to Permiander was under much different circumstances. As a middle-aged woman, the pressure to marry Permiander was not as visible. However, it was there nonetheless. She knew that it was her duty to keep up the appearances of the firm by being married, just as it was Thomas's duty to run the firm. Tony confided to Ida that she knew if she did not do her duty, Tom would be forced to get rid of her, just like Tom got rid of Christian. Tony knew that by being unmarried, she had not escaped the authority of men. When she divorced Grunlich, she was under the authority of her father again, and when her father had died, she was under the authority of Tom, her brother. Tony experienced a whole different set of rules under Perman Permaninder, sorry, Permaninder, than she did under Grunlich. However, when Permaninder decided to take his early retirement, there was nothing Tony could do about it. When Permanender suggested his plan, uh, Mann writes, an argument unfolded that was so serious and violent that it could only undermine the happiness of any marriage at such an early stage. He remained the victor. Her passionate opposition was crushed beneath his desire for taking things easy. Tony's attempts to control Permanender were unsuccessful. Mill has a quote for this as well. I grant that the wife, if she cannot effectually resist, can at least retaliate. She too can make the man's life extremely uncomfortable, and by that power is able to carry many points which she ought, and many which she ought not, to prevail in." End quote. It seems that Tony tried as hard as she could to use this last defense. But Permanender was immune to it. As Mill says, some men are. When Tony decided to end that second marriage, it was not quite as easy as it was with Grunlich. Because Grunlich had been bankrupt, that provided adequate grounds. But there was no such luck with Permanender. In this case, Permanender needed to approve the divorce for it to be legal. It was only Tony's good luck that he decided he wanted to do so. It is worth noting at this point that although Tony's two marriages both ended in disaster, this needed, this needed not be the case. This need not be the case. Uh, Mill writes, men in general do not inflict, nor women suffer, all the misery which could be inflicted and suffered if the full power of tyranny with which the man is legally invested were acted on." End quote. Mann supports Mill's point that the majority of men treat their wives well. Examples of happy marriages in the Boot and Brooks novel vastly outnumber the unhappy marriages. The problems faced by Tony in life as a woman did not end with her, but her daughter Erica endured them as well. Erica's marriage to Hugo Weinschnake was less than successful. Besides Weinschnake's disgraceful arrest and prison term, he also treated Erica badly. It is not because a man is not known to have in broken any of the Ten Commandments, or because he maintains a respectable character in his dealings with those who are not obliged to bear with him, that it is possible to surmise of what sort his conduct will be in the unrestraint of home. Even the commonest men reserve the violent, the sulky, the undisguised selfish side of their character for those who have no power to withstand it." Quoting from Mills. Winchick proved to be a tyrant at home, always demanding Erica to be cheerful even when she did not feel like being cheerful. Tony's description of him shows how he can be. This is Tony describing Winchakes. That rough exterior of his has only got rougher. And all the while he gets harsher and harsher in his demands that Erica be cheerful and keep his mind off his worries. He smashes dishes if she is too serious. You have no idea what it's like when he comes home late at night and locks himself up with his papers. 
And if you knock on the door, you can hear him jump to his feet and shout, Who's that? What do you want? In reading Mill, it is easy not to take his arguments seriously because he is outdated. Uh, is he outdated though? Uh, well, he's outdated in the sense that I think a lot of these kind of 19th century parliamentary laws which officially kept women in subjugation, subjection ha have been repealed. Many of the issues that Mill raised about the subjection of women are no longer relevant. However, comparing it to the issues faced by both Tony and Erica and Budenbrooks, the points he raises are no longer so distant. It is then easy to see the hardships of being a woman, even an upper middle class woman in the 19th century.